Hey guys, Wave Nunley here again, and yet, yet again, Passover and Easter season. Uh, some years, you may have noticed, Passover and Easter coincide perfectly. Uh, this is one of those years. They quite, uh, quite beautifully overlay. So I thought we would do us a session on uh, comparing or connecting uh, the relationship between Passover and Passion Week events as those overlap to help us to better appreciate and understand both of those. So as you observe Passover, as, as you observe Passion Week, including Palm Sunday, Good Friday, um, Easter, then let me just encourage you to keep some of these things in mind that we will uh, discuss today. So these are parallels, again, between Passover and aspects of Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life. One of those things that beautifully overlap are the themes of deliverance and God's miraculous rescue of His people, salvation. The, the Hebrew word yasha means all of that. Um, so you can kind of wrap that all into one uh, beautiful little package, deliverance or rescue or salvation, and from bondage to freedom. And that's the way that God always works in the Bible. It's not just some kind of free-floating uh, 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 deliverance, but it's from something to something. Keep that in mind as you read the Bible from beginning to end. Um, in the New Testament, we read, uh, because obviously we know the story pretty well of God coming, the plagues in Egypt, Moses being the instrument of deliverance, uh, the Passover to celebrate the crossing of the Red Sea, the entrance into the Sinai, and ultimately the, uh, the giving of Torah at Mount Sinai. So with the New Testament, we have, have in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus takes the cup, gave thanks, gives it to them and says, drink because, uh, all of you because this is my blood of the covenant that connects all the way back to every blood sacrifice, all the way back to the original Passover in Exodus chapter 12. This is my blood of the covenant and it is poured out for you uh, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. It's not just some kind of a, a, a one-size-fits-all or broad brush. There's a purpose behind this sacrifice, and that is for deliverance. Deliverance from Egypt and, and, and Egyptian oppression. Deliverance from our uh, uh, sins and the bondage that that holds us in. And perhaps even better one would be Paul's words to the church at Colossae. And he says that Jesus delivered us from the domain of darkness. There's your deliverance, rescue, salvation. He delivered us from the domain of darkness and He transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have, there's that word, redemption. Redemption from e uh, Egyptian bondage, redemption from bondage to the world, to the adversary, and to our own uh, sins and things that we become entrapped in. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, let me just take a second and, and, and point out something that might not be quite as obvious in the narrative of Scripture. When you go from Exodus and the, and the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 12, all the way through the beginning of the book of Joshua, you see this beautiful story of redemptive history, God acting in history to redeem a people to Himself. And what's really interesting is that you get Passover observed in Exodus chapter 12 at the beginning of that big long stage or chapter in redemptive history, God redeeming a people to Himself. You get that beginning in the Exodus chapter 12 at the, at the beginning of God's bringing His people out in, from bondage into freedom. And then in the book of Joshua chapter 5 with this new developmental stage of them entering into the land of Canaan that would be conquered and settled and renamed the land of Israel, then you get this incredible uh, experience of Passover bracketing this chapter in redemptive history. It starts in Exodus 12, you get Passover celebrated there, and the next time that you see Passover celebrated is Joshua chapter 5 as they enter into the land of Canaan. From slavery in Egypt to this glorious freedom in the land of Israel. Um, just a, a beautiful um, brackets on both ends of that uh, in, in, an important part of the God's redemptive history. 
The next uh, parallel connect point between Easter and uh, Passion Week uh, and Passover, it has to do with the commemoration of these events by a sacred meal. So you get the Passover Seder that develops in Judaism and you get a commemoration of this deliverance that happens in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That is commemorated by our observance of what some people call communion or the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Um, a sacred meal is, is instituted to commemorate, to remember, to celebrate those important redemptive acts by God. So let's take a look at some parallels here. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. So the final meal, the last supper of Jesus and His disciples was indeed a Passover meal. So that's an obvious connect point where the two uh, events, the last events in the life of Jesus, uh, death, burial, and resurrection, and also the event of God's deliverance from Egypt is uh, commemorated in a, in, in a meal. And here, that, uh, those two realities coincide. A beautiful parallel there. Paul makes uh, mention of this to his uh, letter to the church, at, first letter to the church at Corinth. And he says, clean out the old leaven. Remember that in the Bible, Passover is ca also called the festival of unleavened bread. So clean out the leaven that you might be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, and there it's, it's shorthand, Christ, our Passover lamb, also has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the feast. So Paul is talking about a commemoration of the death of Jesus as using Passover terminology, language, even mentioning the, the Passover festival itself and other aspects of it, Cleans, cleansing out the leaven, only dealing with unleavened bread, celebrating the festival, a sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Uh, this is a beautiful connection of the two traditions of what goes on in the book of Exodus and then continues to develop in the community uh, of uh, Israelites and Jewish people. And then uh, on the side of uh, the New Testament, followers of Jesus, this just is a beautiful intersection of those tr two traditions. A third point of intersection or parallel has to do with the, the requirement that there be a Passover lamb. And so in the Gospel of John, we find that uh, just like in the book of Exodus, for each family there has to be a Passover lamb sacrificed and then consumed in that sacramental meal, to that commemorative meal. In the Gospel of John, we hear in chapter 19, two times, verse 14, there's another mention in verse 31 about the day of the preparation for the Passover. It's a technical term and it's describing a reality that I think we probably, most Christians at least, look past and that is that Jesus did not die on Passover. And that wasn't the, the requirement, the expectation. Anything that can be done before a holy day, a, a, a special Sabbath, has to be done before. So in the book of Exodus, you get the Passover lamb being slain one day. The next day, actually the end of that day at sundown, the next day in the reckoning of Jewish time, uh, the next day begins and that would be the day of the Passover. So the first day is the day of preparation and the next day is the actual celebration of Passover and consuming of that sacrifice that was offered the day before. So this is exactly in accordance with what goes on at Passover. And this is what happens as according to the Gospel of John. By the way, this day of the preparation for Passover is mentioned in all of the Gospels, but in the other three, it's mentioned in shorthand version. It says just the preparation. So John will help you to unpack the shorthand used in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in terms of the, the time, the day of Jesus crucifixion or His sacrifice and then also uh, moving forward. I interestingly, in, in the Jewish tradition, 
The early rabbis will say, and the text is, uh, is cited here, they crucified him on the eve of Passover. That's the day of the preparation of Passover. So what we're getting is that the rabbinic um, uh, re reference or recollection of the time, the day of Jesus' sacrifice, it co corresponds perfectly with what we get in the Gospels. It's the day of the preparation for Passover. Here it's on the eve of Passover. It means, in both traditions, the day before Passover is celebrated uh, because he practiced magic and enticed Israel to go astray, meaning the same thing that the Gospels say. We know that you're doing miracles and that you're casting out devils, but it's by the power of the, the enemy, not by the power of God. And so that's the claim, but they have a, an accurate recollection of the exact day of Jesus' death on the eve of Passover. Um, interestingly, in the New Testament, you get the same thing. You get exactly the same time mentioned. As Jesus is on the cross, darkness falls over the whole land until the ninth hour, the ninth hour. That's going to be 3 p.m. And uh, Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he died. He breathed his last. We get this ninth hour connection with the death of Jesus in the other two synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Mark, but maybe a little bit less tightly connected. Luke does the best job, so that's the reason I put this text on the screen. Luke and Matthew and Mark are all saying that Jesus died on, at the time of the ninth hour. Why is it that all three of the Gospels, the first three Gospels, specify the ninth hour or 3 p.m. What's the purpose behind that? We get this from our old friend Josephus, that first century Jewish historian who was born and raised in the land of Israel. Unbelievable, uh, unbelievably useful source for New Testament study, background study. Josephus, in his, uh, in his History of the Jewish War, tells us that the high priests at the coming of the feast that's called the Passover, totally relevant to our study today, when they slay their sacrifices from the ninth hour until the eleventh hour. So from 3 p.m. until 5 p.m. Why 5 p.m.? Because at this time of the year and without the benefit of uh, daylight savings time back in those days, the, 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 the eleventh hour or 5 p.m. is really pushing it toward sundown. So to get cleaned up in the temple, to make their way home wherever that might be or wherever their, uh, their Passover uh, celebration that they're going to attend is going to be. They need to stop work at 5 p.m. in time to get home uh, before the Passover begins, at, which is a special Sabbath, and um, uh, that would be at sundown. Sundown in, uh, initiates the next day in Jewish time reckoning. So this is just a beautiful uh, coinciding again of the events of Passion Week not only Jesus' death at, on the day of preparation, or as the rabbis refer to it, the eve of Passover. So we got, we got corroboration both ways, uh, outside the Bible and inside the Bible on the exact day. Now we have corroboration um, between the New Testament and Josephus, outside the Bible and inside the Bible, on the exact time of Jesus' death. I find it really interesting that, that the Gospel writers, all, all of them except for John, specify 3 p.m. What that means is that Jesus in this yearly cycle of Passover offerings is the first to be sacrificed, not the middle, not the last of the pack at 5 p.m. when everybody's trying to hurry up and get everything done um, to get uh, home or to get to whatever place they're going to celebrate the Passover, but Jesus is the first uh, of the Passover sacrifices offered that year, that in that yearly cycle. That to me is absolutely fascinating, goes right to the heart of God and His plan and orchestrating of those events. And Jesus, being the willing sacrifice, yields up His Spirit at exactly the time when the sacrifices for that Passover are beginning in the temple for that year. A fourth parallel, bread and wine. Is that the order or is it wine and bread? You see, because in, in the rabbinic world, um, 
in all of the texts that we have, the, the Mishnah, the Tosefta, the Babylonian Jerusalem Talmud, and even that thing called the Passover Haggadah that gives to us a sort of order of service that you follow when you're doing a Seder meal, all of that, the focus is, uh, the, the elements are introduced, um, bread, uh, wine, and then bread. But in the New Testament, it says Jesus took bread and after blessing that, He broke it and He gave it to the disciples and He said, take, eat, this is my body. So you have bread first and then He took a cup and gave thanks, gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. So the order is bread and wine. And then the, so the question arises, um, great article written by a friend of mine, Dr. Stephen Notley um, of Nyack College. Uh, raising this question, why does Jesus reverse the order of the elements? If it's common and standard practice in all of Judaism that you partake of, you bless and partake of the cup first and then the, the bread, why does Jesus introduce bread first and then cup? Is this, instead of a parallel, some kind of a disjunction in the, uh, the two traditions? Well, what we find is that the rabbis have the order in one way, cup then bread, but Essenes and other sectarians, Jewish people living in the land of Israel, don't necessarily go by the order of cup then bread. In other words, uh, example, the Essenes. This is a text from the Q stands for Qumran. Um, this is a text from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The community rule is a first century set of rules. Here's how you live as a proper Essene. And here in the community rule it says, when the table has been prepared and every one of their meals is a sacramental meal, not just the Passover Seder, but every time the community gathers together as that community of faith, then you get the celebration of a, a commemorative or a, um, a, a communal meal. When the table's been set up and prepared, the priest shall stretch out his hand to bless. Okay, the blessing comes first and then consumption. To bless, and look at the order, the bread and the wine. Absolutely fascinating. Well, where do these guys get that from? Well, there are about six different copies of a book that isn't in the Bible, but was highly revered and respected and studied uh, by the Essenes, by the movement that generated the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of those uh, books, the Book of Jubilees, uh, of which six copies have been found within the Dead Sea Scroll uh, discoveries, um, has an interesting passage. It's toward the end of the book, and it says that all of Israel remained eating the flesh of the Passover and drinking wine and praising and glorifying Yahweh, the God of their fathers. Really interesting text for a couple of reasons. One is, this is a second century BC document. It predates that rules text that we read that the Essenes had written for themselves. But these guys were studying and reading uh, and, and incorporating the teachings of books like the Book of Jubilees into their uh, own sectarian writings, unique to their group or their sect, uh, and they are incorporating we saw in uh, that rules text, this order of, of the elements. You eat, the, uh, you eat first and then you drink. When you are giving thanks, then you eat first and then drink. Uh, and that simply see, seems to be this borrowing from texts like the book of Jubilees, uh, and incorporating into their later rules text. Here's another important point about this Jubilees text. As a second, possibly even early uh, or late third century BC document, the book of Jubilees, this is the first time that the drinking of wine is prescribed, is required um, for a proper Passover celebration. It is not required, for example, in Exodus chapter 12. We don't hear about the drinking of wine as a part of that first Passover meal. So when Jesus is 
blessing the bread and then the wine. Where does the wine come from? You won't find it in the Bible. You're not going to find it in the book of Exodus. You will find it in between the Testaments, developing as Judaism, a living, vibrant um, faith expression, is developing its, uh, in, its, in its own observance of its faith. This then bleeds directly into the, uh, the Passover meal as we see it described. Uh, involving Jesus and His disciples, what we call the Last Supper. Absolutely fascinating material. But then the story doesn't even stop in the second century B.C. It actually goes all the way back to Moses himself. Uh, in the book of Genesis, then you have this person who is called Melchizedek. He comes out to Father Abraham and he brings to Abraham bread and wine. And then he blesses and then Abraham is the recipient of that blessing. Um, and so it's evident then that the Dead Sea community putting a big emphasis on Melchizedek. There's quite a bit written in their own materials about Melchizedek, that he's a heavenly figure, he's a messianic figure, he's going to come and do all kinds of uh, messianic things and things that only God is supposed to be able to do. Melchizedek is a very important figure within the Dead Sea community and he then sets the stage. And so if Melchizedek is introducing elements in this meal that uh, he partakes of, or sets up for Father Abraham, then they're going to follow that first instance. It's happening even before Exodus uh, chapter 12 and the first Passover, so they're going to follow the, um, the example set by, Ab uh, by Melchizedek and Father Abraham. A fifth parallel or connect point is the whole purpose behind uh, the um, Passover celebration and also the celebration of the Last Supper uh, as the Lord's Supper and the elements and uh, all of the uh, various aspects of themes that run uh, redemption, rescue, deliverance, etc. Um, one of the important components is to teach and to pass on the faith. Uh, all kinds of visual representations, symbols, things that uh, point to an even higher and greater um, uh, rea reality. This is a part of both the Passover and also the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Pass on the faith. Teach uh, those maybe that are new in the faith or that are, who are young. And so in the book of Exodus, we hear this from the very beginning in chapter 12 of Exodus, observe this event as an, as an ordinance for you and your children forever. And when, you, uh, when it comes about that you enter the land that the Lord your God will give you, as He has promised, that you shall observe this right. And right, continuing that passage, I just couldn't get it all on the same slide. And it will come about when your children will say to you, what does this rite mean to you? What is this service or this commemorative meal? What is this to you? Then you shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to Yahweh who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when He smote the Egyptians, but He spared our homes. Children are going to ask questions. What do all these strange, different, and unusual things mean? That is still going on in observant homes uh, among the Jewish community today when the pa Passover uh, Seder is observed, the Haggadah is processed through, there's all kinds of symbolic and representative things and actions and prayers and what have you. That's going on and so the children have a response to a, a responsibility to ask several questions that then lead to explanation and a clarification of who they are because of what God has done in their lives absolutely awesome and should be going on in every uh, commemoration or observance or remembrance of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Uh, in Exodus 3, 8, you shall tell your son on that day, it's because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt. Well, what happens if you're like three or four generations after the writing of this and all the original participants are dead? Well, then people are, are going to say, I'm personalizing this three, four hundred years afterward, now in the land of Israel, whole different context, but it's when I, I was maybe 
uh, not even conceived yet, but I was, the, the potential for me was there. Um, and it's like I personally uh, experienced this Passover event. It's the Lord's Passover. What He did for me when I came out of Egypt. And so, not surprisingly, the rabbis pounce on this. And the earliest of the rabbis taught this. It's in the Mishnah, it's in the Babylonian Talmud, it's even in the Passover Haggadah that is used during the Seder service. And it's quoted, in each and every generation, the rabbis say, a person is obligated to regard himself as though he personally left Egypt. Well, this is no different than the kind of personalization than, that we should experience despite the fact that we're 2,000 years with, with tons of centuries and we're many miles in culture and language and what have you removed from the event that brought us into the kingdom of God as followers of Jesus that we should see ourselves as being front and center in that most important redemptive event that God accomplished for the human race. Uh, we have to personalize this. In order for us to move into a personal relationship with God, we've got to see that event is having direct application to us personally. Is it an historical event? Absolutely. But is it, is it also something that has significance to me in my situation, in my lifetime, with my family, with my set of circumstances? Absolutely. Personalize that thing. Paul will say, look, examine yourself. Before you partake of communion, examine yourself. It doesn't get a lot more personal than that, guys. And so this, uh, this uh, emphasis of that, that we see very clearly coming out of the Passover tradition is also being overlaid onto the commemoration of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus that we commemorate with the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Really important point there. Here's another uh, parallel. We've, we're supposed to be in both of these situations. The original exodus from Egypt, the original, the first Passover, as well as the Passover uh, uh, meal that Jesus in instituted the, uh, at the Last Supper, instituted Holy Communion uh, or the Lord's Supper. It, it, it's a, a, an opportunity for us to remember what has been done for us, what God has done, what kind of sacrifice has been offered for us. Um, it really sets the stage for a better, a greater appreciation of those events. The death of the Lamb at Passover, the miraculous deliverance that uh, Israel experienced at the hand of, of God, and then coming right on the heels of that, this all-important covenant made with the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai, which then is intended to keep free people free. They've been set free by the, by the gracious, miraculous work of God. How do you stay right with this holy God that is capable of splitting red seas and bringing uh, ten plagues and delivering an, an entire nation out of bondage in one day? How do you stay in right relationship with that kind of God? Mount Sinai explains that. Here's the way, God says, here's the way that I'm calling on you to live so that you stay in right relationship with me and so that you reflect my nature and character to everybody else around you in your world. We get this in Exodus 13. Remember this day. And the theme of remember is so important. By the way, it's it going on all the way through the entire Bible, but it begins big time right here in this first Passover event. Remember this day. Don't forget it. The day that you were redeemed from slavery and then start obeying me. Nothing leavened this entire uh, time. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Paul talks about this, this remembering. As long as you eat this bread and drink the, the cup, then you are proclaiming, you're showing forth, the King James says, the Lord's death. Remember the price that's been paid. Remember the gracious act of God delivering you from where you were to where He intends you to be, living as free people. A final parallel uh, tr intersection between the Passover themes and the themes of the last week of Jesus' life is looking forward. We're not just looking back. We're ju not just stuck in the past, but it's a look back 
uh, to, in order to look forward with greater clarity. Let the past then inspire hope for the future. So in the Passover Seder, you get things like the seat that's left empty, the whole place setting and the cup that's left empty um, for the arrival of Elijah with the hope, that, that, that earnest hope that it could be during this very meal that the forerunner of the Messiah would show up and would initiate a whole new developmental stage in God's redemptive history, redeeming a people for Himself. Also, during the, the Passover Seder, as a part of the Haggadah, part of the uh, text of the Haggadah says, May the temple be rebuilt speedily and in our days. Again, they're not trapped in the past. They're letting the, the past inform a hope for the future. They want to see that temple rebuilt as an expression of the dwelling presence of God, the blessing of God, reinstitution of sacrifice, forgiveness of sin, and the like. And then the, the, the service ends. The Passover Seder, the, the Haggadah concludes with the hope. Next year in Jerusalem, Hashanah Haba'ah Birushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, the goal is next year maybe we won't, we'll be in a completely different place. Maybe we will be, be in a new and restored uh, Jerusalem. So definitely they're looking back but they're also, and remembering, but they're also looking forward with an expectancy and a hope that is informed by looking in the past. And so in the New Testament, no surprise that we should get a parallel there. Again, in that same text of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, As often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, but the, the, the passage doesn't stop there. You proclaim the Lord's death until He comes, looking back, looking forward. Looking back to that all-important uh, moment that is the hinge of human history where Jesus died for our deliverance, our rescue, our salvation. But it doesn't stop there. There's this future hope that there's going to be a final act of God in ultimate and total restoration of all things and redemption of His people to Himself that will inaugurate a whole new stage of redemptive history um, in, um, the, uh, in our eternal state. When the Messiah comes, the Lord's death you proclaim until He comes. So I'm trusting that you are going to take this opportunity to have learned a little bit about where all of our observant stuff comes from that's included in, folded into uh, the Last Supper and then our commemoration of that event with the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. I'm hoping that you're appreciating that the roots are deep and go all the way back in some respects, all the way back to the, the book of Genesis and the father of the faithful, Abraham, um, and then continue to develop in these beautiful expressions that are intended to be a way to hand this faith on, to pass this on, and to commemorate the incredible faithfulness of God moving on our behalf in the past. Hey, as you approach the Passover season, as you approach the uh, celebration of uh, Palm Sunday, of Good Friday, and of Resurrection Sunday, I trust that th this will help you to better appreciate who you are in God and what we are um, called to be as a people. God bless you in this wonderful, incredible, amazing time of year and may it translate into you then being a more informed um, and better light for Him in your world. God bless you richly. Have an awesome week serving Him.